As for that second fact, Jesus' post-mortem appearances, this fact is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars for the following two reasons. Reason number one, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' appearances, which is quoted by Paul, guarantees that such appearances occurred. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul writes, For I delivered to you what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. This information has been dated to within five years of Jesus' crucifixion. It mentions the appearances to Peter and to the twelve disciples. Paul then goes on to say, Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. According to his letter to the churches of Galatia, Paul was in Jerusalem within six years of Jesus' crucifixion and spent two weeks with Peter and James. Given the early date of this information, as well as Paul's personal acquaintance with the people involved, such appearances can't be written off as legends. Reason number two, the appearance narratives in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of the appearances. For example, the appearance to Peter is attested by Luke and Paul. The appearance to the Twelve is attested by Luke, John, and Paul. And the appearance to the women is attested by Matthew and John. The appearance narrative spans such a breadth of independent sources that it cannot be reasonably denied that the earliest disciples did have such experiences. Even the skeptical critic, Gert Ludemann, Therefore concludes, and I quote, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. Finally, the origin of the disciples' belief in the resurrection. Think of the situation the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jews had no idea of a dying, much less rising, Messiah. Jewish messianic expectations included no idea of a Messiah, who instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies, would be shamefully executed by them as a criminal. Number two, according to Old Testament law, Jesus' execution exposed him as a heretic, a man literally accursed by God. And three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Bishop Spong himself writes in his book, The Easter Moment, that something big and powerful actually happened to produce this change. Indeed, I've rarely seen a more powerful statement of this point than Bishop Spong's. He points out that the lives of both Jesus' disciples and his family were radically transformed, that Sunday became the new holy day rather than the Jewish Sabbath, that God was reconceived to be not just one person, but to include Christ.